Hello, Dark Reader, and welcome to the Dark Side of the Library podcast. I'm your host, Katie. Today, we are going to be talking about, on this mini-sode, Tender is the Flesh. This is by Agustina Bastorica. So, I have, I just want to be very transparent with you. Right up front, I gave this book about a 2 out of 5 star. I'll explain that to you in just a second. We're going to talk about Agustina first. So, she's a Venezuelan writer. She was born in Buenos Aires, and she went to the UBA. She is most recognized for her short stories. Tender is, Tender is the Flesh, I think, is her longest uh, book. She does have another book coming out, and it's called 19 Claws and a Blackbird. It's actually coming out June 20th here. I think it's already been released. I'm, I might have to revisit that. But anyway, she's a very talented writer. She is very well known for her short stories. And she does love to integrate just her passions and her ideas and viewpoints into her stories. She wants to shed a lot of light on some of the problems that exist here on this planet. So she's done that in Tender is the Flesh. This is going to be a little different. So I want to just talk a little more about Augustina's belief system. So I actually agree with pretty much everything she, her viewpoints. I agree with almost everything that she has to say. And she's trying to put a lot of those things into Tender is the Flesh. So something I think I've recognized is that we have three overarching themes in Tender is the Flesh that she was trying to integrate together, and I don't think she did it successfully. That's just my opinion. It doesn't have to be correct, obviously. So the first theme, I wore this shirt on purpose, is uh, we have this theme where capitalism is similar to cannibalism. In fact, there's an article that I'm listing down below in the description that she literally says that. I don't actually disagree with this. Whether or not it's that capitalism has become like the okay word to describe current day government systems because personally I don't believe that like I live in America so I don't think we necessarily follow the strictest of capitalist rule who knows this might be a just a curtain that actually is like an aristocracy maybe it's a mafia rule but regardless it's basically about how consumer culture that we are constantly consuming things, and that's true. We see that today. Our individualism seems to kind of get in the way of society in a lot of ways. We saw that a lot in the pandemic, it seems like. So the comparison to actual cannibalism, okay, I can get behind that. Sure, not a problem. Not only that, but we have a small segment of the population that's just reaping off of the hardworking backs of the middle class and lower class and keeping marginalized groups down and down and down. And that's something that I think I very much agree with Augustina on. Like, yes, I think this is horrible and it needs to change. Another theme in this book, very, I mean, it's kind of obvious, is the literal production of meat or just how we get meat and the meat industry, um, farming, uh, how we treat our animals, the conditions that we keep them in. Um, all of those things are integrated into the story. And I agree what we've done to have a meat industry in an agricultural society, especially as big as the one we have, where we're supporting billions of people around the world. Yeah, it's horrible. I absolutely agree. But I still eat meat. So that's the second theme. And then the last theme, which is kind of, kind of in here, it's not as prevalent as her, like, short stories, but it talks more about women's rights, violence against women. So we see a little bit of that in the book. And, um, that is something that she really wants to talk about. We, we've seen a lot here, and I agree with her. These are things that need to be understood and we need more education on. And especially since in America, where I can say I'm seeing a lot of regression as far as, like, women's rights go, which then sp it spreads onto a bunch of other things, the LGBTQ plus community, for instance. So we're seeing violence towards women, not having any authority of, of our own bodies, um, 
how we view women, all of those things I definitely agree with Augustina on. So very big, very important themes in this novel, but I don't think it was executed as well as it could have. So let me get into that and I'll go into a little more detail. Hopefully I don't chicken walk. I used to have my English teachers tell me I chicken walk all the time. I'll try not to go off on some random tangent for you. I'll try to keep my thoughts as grounded as possible. So let me just start off with explaining the summary. First, I think Augustina has created a story that is very akin to Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. In fact, it just like immediately just brought me to a very similar place. But the thing with Upton Sinclair's The Jungle is that it actually motivated so it motivated people to create actual change to legislature and how we handle the uh, just the industrial complex, like just the workers working in that sort of industry and cleaning it up and how it's not as hazardous anymore. There's so many things there, right? This book has not done that. So here's the summary a little bit. We follow our main character, whose name is Marcos. So Marcos is in the business of slaughtering humans, and nobody actually calls them that anymore in this period of time. So Marcos's wife has left him. Uh, his father is suffering from dementia. He lives in a, uh, in a retirement home, and he uses a lot of his funds from the work that he does to help, you know, just... just fund his father's, you know, home. Marcos also has a sister, Marisa, who is a kind of a social climber and doesn't have like a huge portion of the book, like in the very beginning of the book, she's not as prevalent, but as we progress further in the story, you see more of her. And Marcos is not a huge fan of his sister, Marisa. So we have those characters going on. So he tries not to think so hard about how he makes a living currently, because everything happened so fast. There was this virus that spread amongst the animal community that made the meat toxic to human consumption. So over time, during the transition, the government made it okay to eat actual humans for meat consumption. Marcos, for all of this time, has kind of been a, like day day walking I don't know what you would call it like he's just kind of living not living but he's just like day by day going through his life it's not the best he's just kind of going through it Marcos goes to this breeding center where he gets to see how all of the heads are made so they call all of the people who are grown bred to slaughter heads anyway so the world is that's the kind of dystopian we're working with. Marcos goes to this breeding center, goes through this big tour, and he gets this opportunity to take one of the finest of the heads home with him. This is a gift from the breeding center, and so he takes it home to his farm, and he's, you know, he's supposed to, like, slaughter it. It's supposed to be, like, the finest of meat, right? So instead of that, over time, he starts to treat the head like a human being, and soon he's tortured by the fact that he is contributing to this horrendous, like, uh, way of living and, uh, you know, breeding, slaughtering humans for meat consumption. There's a whole bunch of other things that are going on in this book as well. We have, like, the scavengers, which are people that can't afford meat at all on the market. Like, it's a luxury item, uh, and they will just take any dead body that they can. Uh, we have, again, like, the relationship, brother-sister relationship. Not only that, but kind of like a bit of a past and pre or present um, throwback to his relationship with his father in the before times and then currently now and dealing with just how he's going to be treated when he does eventually die, what do you do with the dead, and, of course, his wife, Cecilia, and um, his female head that he starts to, you know, treat like human and eventually names her Jasmine to this point where he actually uh, ends up having sex with Jasmine and she gets pregnant and is supposed to have his second child. And that's apparently uh, super illegal and he can be killed for it. So there's a lot going on in this novel. 
So right off the bat, let me just say that Augustina is a very talented writer. I enjoyed, her, I really actually did enjoy her writing style. The problem was, was that there was nothing going, like there was no end to it. It just, it was there and you don't really know what to do with it. So that was the problem for me. Nothing to do with Augustina's write, actual writing style. Um, it just, it didn't have a, a clear conclusion and it did seem to have so many hotspot points that it didn't, not, it should have maybe stuck with one of the thing, one of these themes that I'm going to be talking about. The one that's very upfront and in your face is the meat industry. I was enjoying the novel as we go through, and yes, it is incredibly grotesque. She goes into a lot of really gross, sinister detail, especially at the breeding center, how all of these people are actually viewing literal humans and how they slaughter them, how they breed them, the jargon that they use to describe each human or not really each head, um, and just how they, dehum they dehumanize humans. So... Yes, I got the point. It just got a little too much. It wasn't, so for me, it's not like, oh, this is super brutal and it's making me queasy. And it does. By the way, just a trigger warning. This has made people like, this book has been so overly detailed that um, people are like, don't read this while you're eating, you know, that kind of thing. And I agree. I have a strong stomach for this stuff, so it didn't really bother me. What really bothered me was that I feel like it was, it did go really far it was trying to be really brutal to drive a point forward and it felt really militant and it lingered too long at a particular topic or describing how they're slaughtering a human and you can see you know there's very obvious points that this is how we slaughter our actual animals how do you feel about that you should feel really horrible about it um and that to me really put me off immediately. It felt like it was shaming people for eating meat. I am all for reading things that are, you know, pro-vegan, vegetarian, you know, if you wanted to put that in a horror landscape, I was really all for that. That's fine. But it just felt like, it just felt like kind of propaganda at this point. I was like, okay, I get it. I'm horrible because I ate chicken today for, for lunch, you know. So those were things that I really just didn't like. It didn't drive the story forward at all. It just made you feel really shitty. <laughs> it just made you feel like crap about yourself, about the industry, and that's all it was. Like, wow, oh, it sucks. <laughs> okay, so we talked about the meat industry a little bit, but there is so much to unpack. I've actually done like three takes on this because I keep rambling because it's all like, because it's all over the place. So next, let's talk about this whole government conspiracy thing, because when Marcos is going through the breeding center, this is prime time where we see there is this very clear hierarchy. So the richest of people get the most, the, the highest quality of the human meat. They also are eligible to have the delicacies they get just in their breeding for the the wealthiest not only that there's another kind of like background noise that marcos is even convinced that the government is actually it's it's like this big conspiracy that, that maybe this virus that infected all the animals isn't actually real and it's so that it can encourage us to keep eating each other as like population control and that starts to get a little muddy with all of these other big themes that are coming through in this novel. So it's very clear we have this hierarchy. But the problem is, is that our breeding center, the person that's in charge and dealing with a lot of the people that are higher up, the characters are almost cartoonishly evil. They are not believable. They are not relatable. And... In my opinion, and this is just strictly my opinion, I do think that all of us are guilty if we all stumbled upon wealth in some way or power. It can really taint us. You know, I think there's, we all are always striving to consume more. So again, I agree with Augustina on, on that point. 
but I really wished that we had some semblance of humanity or even questioning the actions or just, fi you know, just seeing how they're justifying these things or how they're actually shielding themselves from the fact that they are consuming actual humans. There wasn't a lot there. You just had to take that as at its value that we just eat meat now. That's what it is. And the message didn't really feel very profound. I feel like there could have been something there where she's telling us that we purposefully blind ourselves from the brutalities that we we put on each other as humans or other creatures. We turn a blind eye all the time or we justify it or, you know, just a whole slew of different things. There, there could have been a lot there. And this is especially true of people who are in power. And something interesting is there is a character, a scientist in there, that was conducting human experiments, which wasn't okay in the before times, but now that they are talking about human consumption, now experiments on humans is acceptable. She's very highly regarded in the society, but she just comes off as this cold, arrogant person. We don't get a full spectrum of what this person really was what drove that person to human experiments in the before times and why they still continue to do that and how that's actually tainted them even further it's just a very cartoonish character very you know just evil cold woman character that you've seen over and over again and for something that's talking about how we lack humanity a lot of these characters are lacking humanity, even though I think all of us can get there. But we're all also very vulnerable to getting to treating other people inhumanely. I hope that makes sense. So there's a lot to unpack specifically in regards to like how capitalism and our need to consume and how it benefits the wealthy and how we... You know, people of the middle class, lower class, we are just trying to get by. And that's something that Upton Sinclair did beautifully, was really talk about just the apathy associated with slaughtering animals and those working conditions because we had to do that just to live. And this did not hit the mark at all in that regard for me. So then our last theme, because this is becoming more than just a mini-sode, it's becoming a full episode, is violence towards women. The topic, obviously, itself is very big and clearly needs a lot more light shed upon that uh, and um, education and understanding. But when, in regards to this novel, we have Marcos, who has this female head. And the problem with this whole thing is Marcos... So Marcos is surrounded by women. It doesn't seem like he either, like they're, they're actually not good women or he doesn't see them that well, way. And it's hard to distinguish that because it's from his perspective. So it makes it really difficult to really capture the violence towards women. Even at the end of the story, I was like, Ugh. so at the very Maybe I won't ruin the last line of the story, but honestly, like, if you do read the book, please make sure to comment. Let me know, because that last line of the story, I I actually facepalmed, because I was just like, I don't even know what the purpose was, except for this just being a gore fest. Anyway, that was, that was a derail. So our female head, we start to see sh um, Marcos treating her with some sort of humanity, and she grows... Um, in his eyes, she becomes really important, but that's also because she's pregnant. So that's something that's really prevalent as far as like violence against women and how women are treated and how they are viewed is that it feels like in times of pregnancy and holding a baby, holding the future of the man, um, it's like women are just the bodies, the factories in which that 
the the next segment of the bloodline gets transferred and that's about it and that's when they have their highest power you know men especially violent men won't necessarily do anything because wife is pregnant they might violence around her they might hit they might do violence against her as well pregnant that is absolutely a thing but women being pregnant and providing a bloodline is numero uno and then once that happens when that baby arrives or if there's problems with the baby coming into play uh, that's when things get really pivotal but then once baby is here what do, what purpose does the female have except for more babies nothing else <laughs> so we kind of get some of that in this book and he's also surrounded by a bunch of ladies who he is not exceptionally fond of we don't see a lot of fondness towards his mother in fact, like, the only thing is, is, like, his father had a fondness towards his mother, but I don't really, I don't recall a whole lot of emphasis about Marcos's mom. Marcos does not like his sister. He thinks that she's a social climber. She's a hypocrite, uh, and she doesn't actually give two shits about their father, and he's the only one supporting their father. Very well might be true. Uh, his estranged wife, that's another person. They no longer talk. They don't have their relationship like they used to. And then, of course, we have our research scientist lady. We have our uh, caretaker, like the father's caretaker at the nursing home. And she seems to kind of take place of the mom and is a little more overbearing. But Marcos doesn't actually treat her very well. So there's not a lot of great female characters in this, in this book. And then, of course, we have the female head who can't speak. And she can't speak because one of the points in the in the breeding and the slaughtering house is that they remove their 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 voice boxes. They actually remove them so they cannot speak. So it's again a big metaphor of how women are not able to speak. So even though this was a you know is a very there's a very clear thing about uh, violence against women, um, marginalizing women, and uh, treating women as secondary and living in a patriarchal society, uh, it still did not feel like there was a, a cause, why, what can we do? Um, it's just all brutality. So all of these big, enormous themes, and I agree with Augustina on a lot of her viewpoints, This, all of this was not weaved in a way to promote... I think what she was trying to do, awareness, uh, some sort of progression, maybe some sort of movement to help people understand some of these issues that are happening today, none of that. It was just sheer brutality, just so you can see it and just feel like garbage about it. And there might be a place for that. I just did not feel like it did it very well to the point where I feel motivated to do anything about it. It's just going to be there, which reinforces her point where we just sit there and we watch this shit and we don't do a goddamn thing. And it's really frustrating because that's the book that she's created. I feel like that should be not the book that she created, where we feel motivated to do something about, about this. So again, deep themes. I have clearly a passion about this myself, but I wanted something out of it. I didn't want to just witness this horror, like this inhumane, grotesque thing just unravel before my eyes and feel just guilt, shame, or just really mad. But the anger isn't directed in the right place. It was just frustration with just how muddied everything was in the story. It didn't flow and weave this beautiful web of like wow there's some serious issues here all of these things are together and they're not just together in the story they are together in real life you know um consumerism against people who identify as women and how marginalized groups generally are scavenging struggling 
and honestly providing for the the small 1%. Sorry to say this is a 2 out of 5 for me, um, even though I very much like clearly have a passion for a lot of these topics, I think this could have been executed just a little differently, and clearly because Sin Sinclair was able to do a lot of these things, but I think maybe focusing on one of the themes, honestly maybe even creating like three different stories, it was trying to do a lot of world building, but it, it was just a lot all at once, and it didn't fully connect in a strong way, in my opinion. So that's Tender is the Flesh. This is by Agustina Bastarica. Give it a shot. Again, uh, just a trigger warning. It deals with a lot. Like, it is very grim. It is very brutal. It is lots of gore. If it, it, Like, stomach-churning stuff. Uh, if that's not for you, you probably should not pick this book up. It can be very hard to get through. If you are looking for some other dark reads for the month, especially summertime, this is like perfect vacation time. You're riding in a car. For those of us that don't get car sick, uh, you know, long road trips, pick up a creepy book. Uh, make sure to join us on Wednesdays and Fridays for all of our dark books that are coming out every single month. And make sure to spread the word about Dark Side of the Library to your friends, family, all of your loved ones. Get the word out there. Share Dark Side of the Library. Uh, it really helps us out, and we appreciate it. And join us on our socials. All of that is in the description down below over on YouTube or at Dark Side of the Library. You can also find us on your favorite listening app. Thanks so much for listening and watching, and I'll see you next time.